This program has been funded by Nora Beverages, makers of Naya Spring Water, a proud supporter of intelligent, entertaining, and informative programming on public television. In the hey. Family entertainer, Kay Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Oh, now. Thank you very much. Welcome to our show in the life. First of all, I have to thank all of you for coming out. <laughs> there are people who are puzzled in Iowa right now. They're going, coming out. What does it mean? Actually, we, sometimes we do need a signer for the heterosexually challenged, don't we? <laughs> it's true. But what coming out means is that you admit to yourself that you are either a gay man, which would be difficult for me, or a lesbian. You come out to yourself, you come out to your, your child within, you come out to, if you're a multiple, you have a group meeting and you, you come out to them. Uh, and actually, this show is all about coming out. We're really excited about it. Um, I had the experience of coming out to my older brother uh, again this year. I come out to him every year. Um, <laughs> and I tell him I'm a lesbian and everything, and, uh, and actually not everything, <laughs> because we do have some trade secrets that I don't think I should share with him at all. Uh, but I came out to him, and uh, then we don't talk about it for a whole other year, if you know how that goes. And then I come out to him again, and uh, this year I came out to him again, and he said to me, is that all you can talk about? <laughs> My brother. Actually, and here's a tip for you at home. Never come out to your father in a moving vehicle. <laughs> Just a little tip. This year, though, the great thing was I came out to my nieces and nephews. Now, my nieces and nephews are between the ages of 13 and 17, 18. They're, they're 10 something. OK. And I came out to them, base 10 jokes. I'm crazy about it myself. Anyway, I came out to them. And I came out to them because they're in junior and senior high school. And you know. There's a scandal in our junior and senior high schools, as you know, and that is that we have an unacceptable rate of teen suicides among our gay brothers and sisters. So I came out to them because I don't, I don't know if they're gay. I hope that they are, but, but we hope the best for everybody, don't we? Anyway, I think so. And now, the way I did it, some people, you know, they get a little upset with me, but the way I did it was I talked to my brothers. I said, tell them I'm gay, and then we'll talk. And he said, OK. So I called my brother, Bill Clinton, uh, actually. And I called my brother, and I said, well, how did you do? And he said, well, you know, we told Angela. Now, Angela is this great kid. She's 13 years old. She's a valley girl. And they live in Boston. But that's all right. And uh, we talk about hair and malls, and we're happy. And he said, well, so we told Angela that you're a lesbian. And uh, he said she looked at us across the table and said, Dad, I have only known this my entire life. <laughs> You got to come out. I'm coming out to my nieces and nephews. I'm coming out to my three-year-old niece. I've come out to my little six-year-old nephew. It's working. The other day, my sister called me, and she said, well, I just went by Grace's bedroom. And Grace, who's three years old, had a friend over. And she said, I heard Grace say to her friend, let's pretend we're gay. <laughs> and then the little friend said, well, what does gay mean? What does that mean? And my niece said to her, gay means when two girls get together, dance, and have fun. Wow. Yes. Certainly some family values we can all get behind. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Right now, we'll be right back. Thank you. June 29, 1969, Stonewall, that historic night when gays and lesbians fought back, signaling the beginning of a new liberation movement. And now, the Christopher Mint is proud to present the Stonewall Collection, a special tribute to that night. For a limited time only, you can own this fine collection of unique handcrafted posable action figures. The Stonewall Collection features Dagger the Bull Dyke, Ray the Hustler, John the Sugar Daddy, Betty the Femme, Gloria the Activist, Miss Nina the Drag Queen, and her friends, as well as those 
rugged oppressors from the 10th precinct. The Stonewall Collection. Notice the fine attention to detail. The feather bow and beadwork on Miss Nina. Raised leatherette hot pants, also available in ultra suede. And of course, daggers tattoo. Enjoy them in the comfort of your own home. Order now and receive the handsome paddy wagon carrying case. Other Christopher Mint collectibles have already tripled in value. The Stonewall Collection from the Christopher Mint. It's a celebration of liberation. It's a collection you'll be proud to pass on from generation to uh, generation. Well, we're back. Please help me welcome one of the funniest women on the comedy circuit today. Please help me welcome Sarah Citron. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here on In the Life, and while I'm here, let me ask you all something. Have you seen this road sign that I see when I travel around the country? It's a very strange sign. It says, adopt a highway. <laughs> and every time I see this sign, I think, well, what if you're lesbian or gay? Is it legal to adopt a highway? <laughs> I mean, isn't there a danger? that somehow you'd influence the highway and it would become a lesbian highway? I mean, can you imagine all the traffic accidents when nuclear families realized what they were driving on? Now, of course, these prejudices affect our entire lives. And we all know that as women, as lesbians, as gay men, we are denied certain very basic human rights. I mean, let's face it. The last time most people in this society cared about my rights, I was a fetus. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. And the next time they'll care about my rights is when I die and come back as a whale. In between, they're not really interested. And it was especially difficult growing up as a butch. I mean, I refused to carry a pocketbook. I refused. I used to keep all my extra sanitary napkins in my pencil case. And I'll never forget the trauma of clothing shopping with my mother. Huh? I mean, butchers in the audience. Was this hell or what? Huh? My mother used to make me buy all these Femi clothes. And then when we would get home, she'd make me model them for her. And in her desperation to reinforce any little pathetic glimmer of femininity, she'd have a gorgeous attack. Gorgeous! Gorgeous, 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 gorgeous! So like, you look gorgeous! Turn around, gorgeous! Go upstairs and show your Aunt Gertie. Now the word gorgeous was reserved for female attire. If my brother Warren got a new suit, it was shop! Shop, 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 shop! So like, you look shop! Turn around, shop! Go upstairs and show your Aunt Gertie. So I'd go upstairs. My aunt would give me the once-over. She'd say, Stunning. <laughs> very, very delicate. <laughs> very, very dainty. By this time, I was so miserable that I actually heard what she said as very helpless, <laughs> extremely passive absolutely victimized. But I lived through all this. Thank God for therapy. Thank God. You know, I've been talking about my family with my therapist for so long that now she has her own problems with these people. <laughs> Last week, I was talking about my mother. She goes, look, I don't want to hear a thing that woman has to say. <laughs> but I go to therapy for a lot of reasons. Like another reason I go to therapy is I'm extremely neurotic in relationships. I suffocate people. I mother them to death. And you know, my lover Harriet and I have all these straight friends and they're always complaining about the men that they're involved with. You know, they're cold, they're rejecting, they're uncommunicative. Harriet says to me, why can't you be like that? 
relationships are very challenging, very interesting. Like my friend Marsha is in an interesting relationship now. She's 38, and for the last few months, she's been involved with somebody who's 23. You know, somebody who's still filled with youthful energy and exuberance. <laughs> the first night they're together, her girlfriend says to her, I want to be the most amazing lover that you've ever had. <laughs> Marsha says, sure, go ahead, try. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Woo! She's gorgeous. Sarah Citron, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't she gorgeous? Gorgeous. In the hey. Hi, I'm Garrett Glazer at the beautiful Mondrian Hotel in West Hollywood. Where else? And you're watching... And Thank you. As you know, the list of openly gay celebrities in Hollywood is pretty small. But thanks to our next guest, that's about to change. You recognize him from that wonderful show, Bewitched. His name is Dick Sargent, and we caught up with him in West Hollywood. Let's look at your monitors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dick Sargent. The late Darren Stevens. <laughs> Great pleasure, Mr. Dinsdale. <laughs> the inevitable question is, why did that come out? It's, it's been annoying at me for years. What did your agent say to you when you came out? What? I knew that there'd be a lack of employment. Nobody can ever say that, because it's always a hidden thing, homophobia. But why? That's the same question that's been going through my mind. My life is better than it's ever been. That's because of coming out. It's been like lifting off a burden off my shoulders that I've carried for all these 800 years I've lived. Were you out when you were on The Witch? We never talked about it, but it was there. It was like most families. I think I'm probably the oldest poster boy for anything. I thought I'd never hear you say that. I urge you all to have the courage, demand the respect and the love that we all deserve. God bless you all, my friends. <laughs> You know, if I could go back and do it all over again, here's what I'd do. Say for a two-hour Bewitched uh, reunion movie, tw 20 years later. Well, it goes something like this. Um, Darren and Sam are still happily married. Adam's away at school. Um, Tapna lives in New York City, and uh, she works in advertising, just like her dad. And Darren is still living with his secret, still thinking he's the only mortal in the whole world married to a witch. And somewhere along the way, he meets another mortal who's married to a witch. And then a mortal woman who's married to a warlock. And then another, and another. And Darren has a brainstorm. He forms a support group for the mortal spouses of witches and warlocks. The word gets out, and he's surprised to find out just how many there are, actually are, at least 10% of the population. Darren worries, though, that uh, Tabitha and Adam's friends won't, won't accept the fact that their father is mortal. But after telling them, he finds out they suspect it all along. He never disappeared or time traveled on his own. He, he couldn't wiggle his nose. But they don't care. They like Darren just the way he is. And then finally, when Darren marches in the first mortal pride day parade, his still beautiful wife at his side turns to her and tells her he should have done this years ago. Be proud of who he is and proud of the fact that he's married to a smart, talented witch. They kiss. Uh, it's a wonderful moment. Until he catches a glimpse of Endora in front of the crowd, holding up a sign that says, I'm proud of my mortal son-in-law, Durwood. Hmm. Well, it's a nice dream. Thank you, Dick Sargent. One of the most wonderful plays off-Broadway this season is a wonderful play called The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me. And here to present a selection from this play that's been packing them in all season, please welcome David Drake.
My 16th birthday, June 27th, 1979. The night I held two theater tickets in my hand, one for me and one for him. Tim, the older man, 17. <laughs> Swim team Tim, debate team Tim, title role in the spring musical, Pippin Tim. <laughs> Yeah, that one. The one I had never been totally alone with until this night. Now driving me crazy with the scent of that chlorine bleached hair. <sighs> Filling the air, driving me crazy all the way into downtown Baltimore to see that show. That show I'd wanted to see so, so badly. To see those stories of Broadway gypsies. To hear those stories of New York City come to life from behind each 8x10 glossy in a chorus line. God, I really loved it. I really loved it. How many nights I'd spent locked alone in my room with the original cast album that I had memorized. Singing and dancing and singing and dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing to the sounds now happening live right in front of my 16-year-old eyes, surprised by the stories between the songs, the stories not heard on the album. <laughs> the album that gave me no warning that one story would appear told on the stage all alone that was not my story but was my story out of the mouth of that Puerto Rican dancer boy Paul telling the story of a boy who loves boys a story that had seeped into my childhood sleep at seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, now 16, hiding my swollen eyes from him. Tim at my side, driving silently through the night on the highway, driving home to be alone with the embarrassment of this exposing moment displayed on my tear-smeared, red-blushed face, displayed in front of him, Tim. Ignition clicked off. Engine stopped, parked in the driveway. Watching the fluorescent blue television glow silently explode through the living room's laced curtain bay window. I gotta go, I said. No, wait, he said. You'd better wipe your face as he gave me the white handkerchief from his blue blazer pocket. Thank you, Tim. So, I guess you know that Puerto Rican boy in the show is like me. I'm like that. I know, he said. And I like that. As he reached across the bucket seats, taking a hold of my tear-smeared cheeks to gently place upon my 16-year-old lips one singularly sensational, ooh, sigh, kiss. Porch light, car door, Dad! Living room light, explosions, eruptions, discussions held behind the lace curtain bay window all through the night. Held very far away from what had happened out there in the driveway. Held far away from what had happened out there in that story told from the stage. Held far, far away from what must be allowed to happen somewhere out there in the night. Somewhere out there, far, far, far away from my sweet 16-year-old birthday site, they said, you can't be gay. I said... I am. They said, it's a phase. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> they said, well, even if you were gay, which you are not, we don't care, we don't care, we really don't care. And I said, well, I do. Which blew their arms and voices through the roof. Oh, great, great, now what are we supposed to do? You know, there's a place for people like you. Yeah, New York. <laughs>
Jerry Kramer Kiss Me. What a wonderful play. And now we welcome to our stage here at In the Life an openly gay comedian. You've seen him on Joy Behar. You've seen him on Comedy Central. Openly gay comic. And now he's on MTV. Please welcome Frank Maya. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. You know, I'm doing this uh, gay comedy around the country, straight audiences, gay audiences. People say to me, isn't it weird going out? Is it scary, you know? And actually, you know, it depends on the city you're in. Like, I was recently in San Francisco. Now, San Francisco is so gay, it is ridiculous. You know that, right? I mean, I live in the gay section of Manhattan, you know, the West Village, you know, it's kind of dark and dingy, but I don't know if you're the Castro. The Castro is so, like, pretty, it gets me sick. Okay, it gets me sick, basically. <laughs> I mean, all those other Victorian houses painted gold and pink and orange and perfect window boxes and people in leather leaning out going, hello, good morning, <laughs> we're gay, hi. You, know, <laughs> you feel like you're visiting the gay pavilion at Disneyland. It's like. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> unreal. So I have this new commitment to myself, basically, that you know, even though I'm gay on stage, I really want to be gay everywhere I go. Like, you know, if someone says something homophobic, you know, it's scary, like in alleyways or cabs or you know, in a subway, to actually stand up for yourself and say, you know, well, wait a minute, I'm gay. You know, if someone says faggot or something, but I have this new commitment, right? So I'm on the plane from L.A. recently, coming back uh, to New York, and it's packed. Okay, packed. And I'm always worried. I get these businessmen sitting next to me, you know, who they'll say they start talking about the faggots or something, you know. And I, you know, what do you do? You sit there, should you make a big fight? You know, what should you do? So anyway, I'm on this plane, and I'm always nervous on planes. Anyway, you know, I mean, not about crashing, but like my skin drying out. You know, so I feel, you know. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm always the only big queen on the plane. You know, I've got my Evian water, my moisturizer, you know, and the, and the stewardesses are all laughing at me. You know, and everyone, by the end of the flight, they all look like Apple dolls. You know, their faces all dried up, and I look beautiful. Okay, so. I'm on the flight, and it's packed, except there's one empty seat next to me, which I'm so thankful for. I'm just so happy. Then right before we take off, this huge cowboy, this redneck, walks in, you know, big 10-gallon hat, cowboy boots, six foot three, unshaven, got you know, headphones on with Willie Nelson blasting. I'm going, God, please, not here, not next to me. I just, this guy's going to cause trouble, right? So he comes down the aisle. He's like, excuse me, partner, this is my seat. You know, and he sits down next to me. And, um, Thinking, okay, I know we're going to have trouble because I see our steward is this big queen. He comes leaping out of the galley. He's like, you know, you know, the kind of guy who wanted to be like in a Broadway show, never made it, right? And so he's going to entertain us the whole flight. This guy, is, he's got this skinny little beard, you know, a little chubby. And he's like giving the evacuation. Thing. He's voguing, doing the exit signs. He's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the air mask. He's like, <laughs> big entertainment, right? And so... He comes down the aisle, he sees me and the cowboy, and he thinks we're boyfriends. He's winking, going, hey, boys, you know. <laughs> right, free drinks, you know. The cowboy's looking at me going, oh, God, you know. Like, and I'm thinking, don't start in. Please do not start in. So anyway, we go up in there. He's like drinking and listening to Will and Nelson. And after a while, he starts getting friendly. He goes, you know, uh, you know, where are you from? I said, Manhattan. You know? And he goes, well, what part? Now, I know if I say West Village, right, the guy's going to know I'm gay. He's going to start needling me like, you know, do you have a girlfriend? You know, this kind of business, right? So I go, I, I have to be honest, you know, I say, um, well, actually, I'm from the West Village. And he, uh, he see, looks at the steward and he goes, uh, aren't there a lot of them down there? So I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go, okay, the trouble is going to begin. But I have to, you know, I'm going to die, but I don't care, I'm going to say something, right? <laughs> so I go, well, actually, you know, I am one of them. And all of a sudden he looks at me, he goes, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> he was a big queen, all of a sudden I'm flying with Paul Lynn, he's like, no, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Drunk out of his mind, all of a sudden he takes away all the Willie Nelson tapes, puts them away, puts on Judy Garland at Carnegie Hall. He's drunk, going ding, 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 where's the trolley? <laughs> Thanks a lot, thank you. Thank you, that's Frank Maya. Thank you so much, our own Frank Maya. What a wonderful show. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next month. <laughs>
This program has been funded by Nora Beverages, makers of Naya Springwater, a proud supporter of intelligent, entertaining, and informative programming on public television.